Five days after the roadside incident, it was the Hunt twins' birthday party. The entire house had been busy since morning making the final preparations. Even though the birthday party was in the evening, all types of fresh ingredients were delivered beginning in the early morning. And while the Hunt Manor was quite frantic, it was still rather orderly. In the hall of Justin's villa, Cherry was spinning around in her beautiful pink dress, and Pete looked like a little gentleman in his three-piece suit. But Xander decided to go casual. He wore a white short-sleeved t-shirt and black shorts with a red baseball hat on top. He certainly stood out as not being dressed appropriately. The butler stood next to the boy with a small suit on a hanger in his hand, pleading with him. Xander, please change into this suit first before you go downstairs. Xander put his hands on his hips. He grinned and said, What difference does it make what I wear? Mr. Hunt and Miss Smith haven't proven that I'm their son yet, and until they do, I'll wear what I want. Xander had asked her five days ago, Do you have any evidence that I am your son? And Nora's answer had been, Not yet, but it is a fact that I have given birth to triplets. Xander pursed his lips, But that doesn't mean that I'm the third. She just nodded her head but didn't say anything else. Xander's pride came out. He stuck his chin out and said defiantly, If there's no evidence, I won't acknowledge you as my mother. Even if Justin might be my real father. So, Xander raised his little chin higher. Bring out the evidence if you want me to acknowledge you. Nora learned her first lesson about Xander. His proud personality meant that he liked it when others begged him for things. Helpless, she had to concede. But she knew that it wouldn't be long now until she had the scientific proof, because the DNA test report that Lily was working on was about to come out. Nora, because of her hand injury, was staying with the Smiths. She spent her days catching up on her sleep, her speediest form of recovery. Pete and Cherry both stayed at the Hunt Manor, When their mother finally woke up, she went straight to the hospital in search of Lily. Once she found her, Lily spoke before Nora could say a word. I'm working on it, boss. There's nothing you can do here. Go on to the birthday party and I'll let you know as soon as I find out anything. Nora sighed. Thank you, Lily. It's just no need to explain. There's nothing we can do to speed up the process. Nora conceded to her. I know that you're doing what you can. I promise I won't come back again until you're done. She rushed over to the Hunt Manor and found several people in the front hall awaiting her arrival. Xander glanced at the door, his eyes filled with anticipation. Nevertheless, he deliberately pretended not to care. Sss, the report isn't out yet. They sure are slow. Hey, is your girlfriend okay? The last sentence was directed toward Justin, who was sitting on the sofa anxious for Nora's arrival and Xander's proof. With Xander's comment, Justin grimaced and pushed his anger down. Once he had confirmed the little boy's identity, he was doing his best to tolerate the disrespectful behavior the boy demonstrated. After the incident, and before she had left to go to the Smiths for her sleep, Nora reminded him to try and get along with Xander. Do your best not to provoke him. She smiled as she stroked his face before leaving. Justin didn't want Xander to complain to Nora that his father wasn't treating him well. But it wasn't easy to ignore the boy's manipulative ways. He had really tolerated everything these past few days, but it was taking its toll on him. He took a deep breath and told himself that this was his biological son who'd had a difficult upbringing. After he calmed himself down, he stood up and went over to the computer on his desk. Xander smirked and grinned at Pete. I guess your father is a mute. Justin clenched his jaw and the veins popped on his forehead. Pete rolled his eyes. Don't go overboard, Xander. If that DNA report says that you're not his son, you'll be in big trouble. Even someone as bold as Xander was shocked by these words. Anxious, he swallowed and turned to look at the door again and then asked, How's your mother's hand? Xander knew that Nora had been injured saving him, 
so he was genuinely concerned. He wanted to know how she was. Pete replied, I don't know. Can't you call and ask? Don't you care? Pete rolled his eyes. I am surprised you do. You're the reason my mother got injured. Of course he had gone to see his mother, but he wasn't about to let Xander know that. Two days ago, he went to the Smiths. He had even called out to Xander and asked him if he wanted to go with him. But Xander had arrogantly rejected him. And now he wanted to know how she was? The two boys were about to quarrel when they heard footsteps coming to the door. Nora entered with the DNA report in her hand. Downstairs in the front hall, Mrs. Hunt held Mrs. Livingston's hand and looked around. Mrs. Livingston said angrily, Mrs. Hunt, you know Nora is so full of herself. She refused to treat Thomas. She wouldn't even see him, so we were forced to buy someone else's appointment in order to cut the queue for her to see him. But then the doctor found out about the swap, so she cancelled it. Mrs. Hunt attempted to brush her off. With all that has been going on, Nora must have been quite busy lately. Mrs. Livingston wanted to know more, so she asked, Why? That illegitimate child was in on a plot to kidnap Pete, so she went to rescue him. She even injured her hand in the attempt. I don't understand why, but that illegitimate child was brought back here by Justin. Nora is so angry that she hasn't visited for four days. She sniffed judgmentally. Any normal mother would have come over and kept an eye on her son and daughter and helped with their birthday party preparations. Mrs. Livingston sneered. Well, I think that's all for the best. I'm sure that Justin was only interested in her for a moment. I don't know how he can stand her bad temper. Not to mention that little brat that is hanging around. He was in on the kidnapping of Pete this time, and who knows what he'll do the next. We all know that he will be the barrier between her and Justin for the rest of their lives. There's no denying it. Time passed slowly. Soon, the sky turned dark, but the Hunt Manor was brightly lit. All kinds of luxury cars were gathered. When they arrived at the Hunt's compound, everyone listened to the security guards obediently and parked their cars as instructed. Only a manor as big as the Hunt's and Smith's could hold so many cars. Everyone was dressed very well, wearing couture gowns and designer suits. They entered the hall with smiles. Those who were invited by the Hunts to their children's birthday party were all famous figures in New York. For a moment, the hall was filled with people's greetings. Some families in this social circle would often have the leader of the family greet guests at the front hall whenever they held events such as a banquet or a party. For events like these, the Hunts usually sent a member of their side family to greet the guests. Therefore, Justin did not appear in the hall at all. But, since this was a standard practice at the Hunt Manor, no one felt neglected or ignored. Instead, they entered the hall humbly, honoured to be invited to such a special event in the impressive mansion. The usual cocktail fare of conversation filled the room with noisy chatter. What's the latest stock trend? Who's marrying whom next season? Everyone gossiped and joked while secretly wondering if they would be invited upstairs to meet with Justin in private. Everyone wanted to get to know Justin. In the past, on such occasions, he would invite a few people upstairs for a chat. Some were businessmen and their spouses. Others were newly appointed CEOs. But, as of yet, no one had been invited upstairs. Yes, I wonder who will be invited up. So what if someone gets invited upstairs? What's rarer is for Mr. Hunt to come downstairs to personally welcome someone, right? He's so proud and aloof. It seems like he has never welcomed a guest at the door before. You're thinking too much. Why would Mr. Hunt come downstairs tonight when he never has in the past? As a few of the guests chatted, they saw someone fling open the door to his study upstairs. The room fell silent. He straightened his jacket as he rushed down the stairs. 
Everyone stared as the handsome man strode quickly down the steps and out the door without acknowledging anyone present. Who was he rushing to greet? The partygoers all peered through the massive front door and witnessed Justin respectfully supporting Ian Smith as he climbed out the back of his limousine. He gently held Ian's arm with his head bowed slightly in a courteous manner. Joel followed behind the two of them with a smile, and with him was Tanya, holding Mia's hand. The respect that Justin showed Ian and his family demonstrated to everyone how important the Smith family was in relation to the Hunts. They were comparable competitors. In the past, Justin would not lower his head in front of the Smiths because he was powerful and did not fear them. But soon, he planned on becoming their future son-in-law. Justin's respectful attitude toward Ian and the way he completely placed himself at the other man's service made it clear to everyone how he felt. Mr. Hunt was extremely happy with Miss Smith. It made sense. After all, Miss Smith had given birth to two children for Justin. Everyone was thinking about this couple until they noticed the butler supporting Mrs. Hunt and walking toward Ian and the others. As soon as she walked over, she smiled and said, Ian, you're here. Ian frowned. Justin and Nora were already engaged. Under such circumstances, he could not throw a tantrum and refused to acknowledge this man as his son-in-law. Ian nodded. Mrs. Hunt, how are you feeling today? Mrs. Hunt sighed and said heavily, Not very well. I worry about my family every night. Before he could say anything, Mrs. Hunt said, It's our Justin who has let the Smiths down regarding Xander. However, Xander is also Justin's child, his biological son, so I can't give up on him just yet. Ian, I'll apologize to you right here. Please, I hope the Smiths can let bygones be bygones. We can start anew and be good in-laws for the future of both our families. As soon as she said this, the room was filled with murmurs as the guests gossiped. No wonder Mr. Hunt is so polite to the Smiths. So he did something wrong. It seems like the matter of this illegitimate child is true, but Mrs. Hunt is really muddled-headed to mention this in front of so many people. That's right. If the Smiths forgave Mr. Hunt, it would make the Smiths lose face. It's as if the Smiths are one level lower than the Hunts. But if they don't forgive them, are they going to argue on the spot? Mrs. Hunt is becoming more and more confusing. A naysayer sneered. What are you talking about? Mrs. Hunt is openly dissing her future granddaughter-in-law. This comment made everyone go silent because they sensed that the battle between Mrs. Hunt and Miss Smith was about to commence. Ian stared at Mrs. Hunt with coldness in his eyes. How could he not know about the most heated discussion in New York? At home, he had asked Nora if she wanted to clarify things. In the end, Nora said that the truth was the same as the gossip taking place in the outside world. As for the details, they would be revealed today. Therefore, Ian suppressed the anger in his heart and nodded at Mrs. Hunt before going upstairs. It was his grandchildren's birthday today. He did not want to argue here. It was not the proper time nor place for such a discussion. If Ian did not speak, Mrs. Hunt would take it that he had given in. However, Looking at him like this, Mrs. Hunt raised her nose and said, Ian, you're forgiving Justin, right? I knew it. Miss Smith is a good child and you two are reasonable people. Besides, Miss Smith and Justin already have two children. Even if it's just for the sake of Pete and Jerry, she has to bear with it. These words made even more people frown. They felt that something was wrong. What was it that she would have to endure it for the sake of the children? Did the old lady want to use the children to extort Nora? It seemed as though Mrs. Hunt was implying that because Nora got pregnant before marriage, she could only marry into the Hunt family. Ian slowly frowned. Mrs. Hunt, what do you mean? Mrs. Hunt continued to pretend to be ignorant. What I mean is, for the sake of Cherry and Pete, 
the Smiths shouldn't cause a fuss with our family. Look, you're here for their birthday party today. Does this mean that you are no longer concerned about the animosity between our families anymore? There was no change in his expression, but he was furious deep down. His daughter had not yet married into the family, but she was already being looked down upon. This was too much. He was about to speak when Mrs. Hunt continued, From now on, we're all family. I have to treat Xander better. He's so pitiful. Without a mother by his side, it is easy to understand his difficult personality and flagrant disregard for the rest of us. She scanned the room to make sure everyone had heard her claim. But before she could continue, Justin slowly turned to her and stated, Grandma, Xander has a mother. When Justin made the announcement regarding Xander's mother, the entire room fell silent. Everyone smirked with amusement. Mrs. Hunt was stunned. When she had asked Justin about Xander's mother, he had said that if that person dared to appear, he would definitely kill her. But he qualified that statement by saying that he thought the boy's mother was, in fact, actually dead. So how was it possible that the mother was making an appearance now? Mrs. Hunt had appeared in front of Ian, announcing the illegitimate child in front of so many people. She had made sure to let everyone know that Nora had the children out of wedlock to give Nora a negative reputation within upper-class circles in New York. This had been Mrs. Hunt's attempt to control her future daughter-in-law, so that Mrs. Hunt would remain the head matriarch of the family. She still resented that last request she had made of Nora. She had wanted Nora to treat Thomas as a favor to her, and Nora had rejected her, disregarding her concerns altogether. But now, Justin said that Xander's mother had returned. And it was clear to Mrs. Hunt that Justin was not seeking revenge against the woman. This had also surprised Mrs. Hunt. Ian, on the other hand, was not feeling good about any of this, which was clear by the way he looked unhappily at Justin. What was the meaning of this? Luckily, the scheming Ian managed to not explode on the spot. This was his grandson and granddaughter's birthday party. No matter how many grievances he felt, he had to suppress them, for now. Mrs. Hunt bristled with anxiety. Before she could say anything, Mrs. Livingston, who had been standing beside her, observed the commotion and said, Huh? Mr. Hunt, you know Xander's mother? It must not have been easy for that woman to give birth to your child and raise him for five years without anyone's help. Our family really should treat her well, don't you think? Mrs. Hunt twitched. She wanted to control Nora, but she also wanted this important and powerful woman as granddaughter-in-law. Nora was Ian's only daughter, plus she was an exceptional doctor, meaning Mrs. Hunt wouldn't have to worry about her health in her old age. It was very important to Mrs. Hunt that this new mother figure not get in the way of Nora becoming a part of the family. On the other hand, Mrs. Livingston wanted to foil this engagement. Her son, Thomas, had gone to several hospitals but could not be treated. He even went to see a traditional alternative medicine doctor. In the end, the doctor told her that the damage had been done and that he would probably never recover. But, if he was willing to try, only Dr. Zabe, or his main disciple, would be able to treat him. So this meant that his only hope was still Nora, and she refused to help him. That was why Mrs. Livingston hated Nora. She had once threatened Nora, if you don't treat my son, then don't even think about living well. Mrs. Livingston was about to say something when Mrs. Hunt clutched her forearm and prevented her from speaking. Mrs. Hunt said, Justin, you're being ridiculous. How could Xander have a mother? Even if he does, our family will never admit it. On behalf of the Hunts, I only acknowledge Nora as my granddaughter-in-law. With that, she turned to Justin and scolded him. I don't care how you feel about Xander's mother. 
I want to make it clear that she's never going to be allowed to enter this family. Do you hear me? Mrs. Hunt's attitude changed drastically. Justin's eyes narrowed. Just as he was about to announce who Xander's mother was, Mrs. Livingston said, Oh, Auntie, I think you're wrong. She's Xander's mother after all. It's only natural that she would want to be with her son, so why shouldn't she marry into the family? Or maybe, if Miss Smith marries Mr. Hunt, she could choose to be magnanimous and accept this new woman as Justin's mistress. She can't object to that. We're all dignified people, and it's quite normal to have a mistress for us, is it not? Her voice was full of venom as she imagined the betrayal Nora would feel. She compared Xander's mother to a mistress. Under such circumstances, if Ian did not break off his daughter's engagement soon, the entirety of New York would laugh at the Smiths. If Nora continued with the wedding and accepted this other woman into the family, the entire Smiths family would be looked down upon. They all knew that the Hunts would gain the upper hand over the Smiths and would never relinquish it. Ian pursed his lips and looked at Justin again. He had seen with his own eyes how much Justin cared for Nora. He knew there must be a good reason for him to mention Xander's mother at their children's birthday party. He also observed that Justin had remained quite calm in this regard. And it immediately occurred to Ian why. Could it be? Ian's eyes lit up. After Mrs. Livingston suggested that a mistress come into their family, Mrs. Hunt's expression changed drastically. She pointed at her and barked, How can you make such an ignorant statement? How could a woman like that enter my family? Justin won't have anything to do with that kind of woman in the future. Mrs. Hunt was furious. No matter how important her maternal family was, they were not as important as her grandson. Mrs. Livingston's words appalled and horrified her. Mrs. Livingston covered her mouth and laughed. Auntie, why are you so angry? Justin didn't even say who she was. You never know. She might even be a daughter of a wealthy family. Look at you. You're completely rejecting her without even knowing who she is. Mrs. Hunt lowered her eyes. I don't care who she is. I won't acknowledge her. She had meticulously raised Pete to have a high IQ. He was someone more outstanding than Justin and was destined to become the Hunt's heir. She would not sacrifice Pete's potential by adding some harlot to his family. As soon as Mrs. Hunt finished speaking, Justin reassured her by saying, Xander's mother is indeed from a wealthy family. Mrs. Livingston smiled. Oh, really? Who is it? Do we know each other? Justin continued to smile at the room full of shocked reactions. Yes, Xander's mother is from a wealthy family. In fact, you should have heard of her by now. Mrs. Livingston was even more excited. Oh, goodness, tell me who she is. Beside her, Mrs. Hunt pulled Mrs. Livingston's hand hard and attempted to pinch her arm. But Mrs. Livingston paid no attention. Mrs. Hunt's anger rose. She was ready to throw Mrs. Livingston out. She was only in this family by marriage anyway. Why did her maternal family have such a foolish niece-in-law? She could tell that the silly woman was only after one thing, to ruin her grandson's engagement to Nora. Mrs. Hunt's blood boiled. She felt that she had put down her granddaughter-in-law here in defense of her maiden family. But what had her maiden family done for her in return? This woman was making a fool of herself. No one could argue that Nora was the best candidate for being the Hunt's daughter-in-law and the future matriarch of the family. But if Mrs. Livingston continued down this path and ruined this future marriage, how could Nora still have the face to stay in the Hunt's family? Mrs. Hunt looked at her in disgust. For so many years, Mrs. Hunt had been working hard for her mother's side of the family. 
the Livingstons had long been in dire straits. If not for Mrs. Hunt being there for them, the Livingstons would probably have been displaced from the first tier of the wealthy families in New York. She had done so much for her maternal family. And what did she get in return? Nothing but humiliation and deception. Mrs. Hunt was furious at her niece-in-law and wished the woman would just keep her mouth shut. Since that wasn't possible, she turned to Justin and tried to figure out what was happening with him today. She knew how much he cared about Nora, but he had brought up this other woman in front of Ian Smith. Did that mean he was changing his mind about his future bride? Whispered discussions filled the entire banquet hall. Oh my God. Is Mr. Hunt not planning to marry into the Smiths? But why was he so respectful to Mr. Smith? It could be an apology, right? Miss Smith is so pitiful. She isn't even married yet, but she's already fighting for favor with others. Whose daughter is she? How can she seduce Mr. Hunt? Hasn't Mr. Hunt been pure of heart for so many years? When we were young, we even said that he didn't get close to women. As the crowd whispered, Justin lowered his eyes and smiled. He had achieved his goal. After all, Mrs. Hunt was his grandmother. He knew that the conflict with Mrs. Livingston and Thomas caused Mrs. Smith to become very dissatisfied with Nora and had even caused his grandmother a lot of trouble privately. Justin wanted to make sure that Mrs. Hunt could see the true colors of Nora's mother's family. Mrs. Hunt was his beloved grandmother who had raised him, he could not chase her out when she was old. Furthermore, she had given her heart to Pete before. Therefore, when Mrs. Hunt first spoke, he did not stop her and even added fuel to the fire. He did this so that Mrs. Livingston would reveal her true nature. He wanted Mrs. Hunt to see for herself and dismiss the arrogant Mrs. Livingston. Only then did Justin slowly say, Not only has Mrs. Livingston heard of the eldest daughter of the Smiths, but she has also seen her, right? Everyone was puzzled, not understanding what he was saying. Mrs. Livingston was stunned. The Smiths? Which Smiths? At the mention of the Smiths, everyone would only think of the Smiths in New York. But was there another wealthy Smith family? Justin lowered his eyes and sneered before looking at Mrs. Hunt. Mrs. Hunt looked at Justin in shock and felt stunned. Could it be? Ha 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 ha. Ian's loud laughter filled the entire banquet hall. Then he patted Justin's shoulder. Triplets. So Nora gave birth to triplets. He raised his head proudly. Three at a time. My daughter is so amazing. The entire place was in an uproar. Everyone exploded and discussed the topic fervently. Miss Smith gave birth to three children in one go. She is too lucky. Oh my God, so there are no illegitimate children at all. All three children were born to Miss Smith. Now it makes sense why Mr. Hunt was so polite to Ian Smith. Mrs. Hunt was also overjoyed and heaved a sigh of relief. Justin said, That's right. Peter Hunt, Cheryl Smith, and Xander Yale all belong to Nora and myself. All three are our children. With that, the surrounding people congratulated him. Mr. Hunt, congratulations. Three children, two sons and a daughter. Mr. Hunt is so lucky. Some people congratulated Ian. Ian, you have three more grandchildren now. Congratulations. <laughs> but you're going to have to spend a lot of money. Did you bring three gifts? Ian was overjoyed. Of course, and I'll be happy to bring more. The others immediately got their family members to go back and prepare another gift. After all, they had only prepared two sets of gifts for the twins. The people around them became busy. The great-grandmother was clearly Mrs. Hunt, but everyone ignored her no one came forward to congratulate her. They could all see Miss Smith's status in the Hunt's family in the future. 
Mrs. Hunt glared at Mrs. Livingston and forced a smile. So, it's a misunderstanding. Mrs. Hunt felt like a clown who had been laughed at by everyone. She undermined her granddaughter-in-law, but her attempt backfired, shooting her status up even higher. With that, she pulled Mrs. Livingston to the side. Come with me. The two of them left the hall and entered the lounge beside it. As soon as they entered, Mrs. Hunt turned around and slapped Mrs. Livingston. Stop it, she shouted angrily. What did you mean earlier? You made things so awkward for me. Mrs. Livingston covered her face and her eyes darted around before she sighed. Auntie, I'm doing this for your own good. That little hussy hasn't married into the family yet, but she has yet to give you any respect. Do you think that is going to change if she marries Justin in the future? Mrs. Hunt was furious and her heart turned colder. You don't have to find excuses. You only want to interfere in this marriage for selfish reasons of your own. Mrs. Livingston pursed her lips and whispered, Well, what do you care? I failed in the end anyway, didn't I? This admission made the old madam's eyes turn cold. She said coldly, I'm Justin's grandmother. He won't do anything to me. But who do you think you are? You come to his children's birthday party and actually dare to humiliate the Smiths in public? Mrs. Livingston covered her face and said, Auntie, I'm your niece-in-law. He has to forgive me eventually, right? What can he do to me? Her disdainful expression stabbed Mrs. Hunt through the heart like a needle. Before Mrs. Hunt could retort, the door flew open and the Livingstons rushed in with flustered expressions. Something important must have just happened outside. When Mrs. Livingston saw the new person, she was a little stunned and asked, What's wrong? That person leaned over and whispered something in Mrs. Livingston's ear. Mrs. Livingston suddenly stood up and looked at that person. What did you say? The Stuarts aren't cooperating with us anymore? The person smiled bitterly. It's not just the Stuarts. The Levens, the Sonnets, and the Lowes have all conveyed their intentions to cancel their collaboration with us. I heard that it's because... The person glanced at the old lady. Because of Mr. Hunt. The Livingstons were dishonest in their business. Their prices were high, and their quality was bad. But there were still so many people fawning on them, mainly because they wanted to establish ties with the Hunts through the Livingstons' connection to Mrs. Hunt. Now that Mrs. Livingston had openly angered Justin, even if Justin did not say a word regarding the matter, this fair-weather social circle had revoked their cooperation immediately. No one wanted to bring the wrath of the Hunts down on them. Mrs. Livingston was completely stunned. She stared at Mrs. Hunt, understanding she had made a grave error. She spoke in disbelief. How, how dare he? Justin had been very respectful to Mrs. Hunt since he was young. He also handled the Livingstons' matters with diligence, so Mrs. Livingston had opposed Nora publicly with complete confidence. She had never expected Justin to do this for Nora. He'd never done anything like this in the past. She swallowed and fell to her knees in front of Mrs. Hunt. Please, Auntie, you can't ignore us. If you don't help us, the Livingstons will go bankrupt. Mrs. Hunt motioned to Mrs. Livingston to lower her voice. Then, waving her off, she stated, Don't be anxious, I'll talk to Justin later. But Mrs. Hunt had openly provoked Ian earlier, and it had made Justin unhappy so Mrs. Livingston had her doubts. Then again, Mrs. Hunt had watched him grow up, so she felt that she knew Justin quite well. Justin had not revealed the truth about Nora initially. Instead, he let Mrs. Livingston badmouth Nora publicly, accusing her of being a foolish woman for accepting someone else's child in her home. It was only after Mrs. Livingston had gone out on a limb that Justin took the opportunity to break that branch 
by revealing the truth and watching her fall to the ground. His intention was to embarrass her and teach her a lesson, and Justin was successful in achieving his goal. As his grandmother, Mrs. Hunt understood that Justin had a good heart and valued relationships above all else. As a result, he demonstrated his complete loyalty to his future bride, Nora, over distant blood relations. Upon reflection, Mrs. Hunt knew that he would not do anything to Nora, but he would have no qualms about falling out with his own grandmother, who had practically raised him. Since Justin was now in charge of the Hunt family fortune, Mrs. Hunt was concerned that if his heart left her, she would be at risk for losing her current status. If this was the case and he abandoned her, how would she be able to live at the same level of comfort in the future? Mrs. Hunt wanted to wait and make sure that Justin was no longer angry. When the time was right, and only then, she would mention the Livingstons to Justin and hopefully ease the relationship between the two families. But, as usual, Mrs. Livingston demonstrated her unpleasant and impatient nature. She immediately shouted, Auntie, Thomas is your grandnephew. We are descendants of your mother's family. We are your blood relations, and yet everyone now considers us a joke. Go look for Mr. Hunt immediately. I know that he would never be able to reject your request. When Mrs. Hunt heard her demand, she turned and went out to the party area outside. When they were outside, Mrs. Livingston did not wait for her, but insisted on going against Nora because she felt that this future niece-in-law of hers was being unreasonable and not considering her or her son's issues as important. Being ignored like this was making the woman even more self-righteous. Mrs. Hunt felt her heart breaking. She was beginning to realize that the family she loved so dearly had been using her all along. The old lady covered her chest and waved at Mrs. Livingston. Get out! Mrs. Livingston was stunned. She stared at Mrs. Hunt's hideous expression. She looked as if she could not breathe. She was instantly frightened and did not dare to speak again. However, before leaving the room, she could not help but turn back and look at Mrs. Hunt. Seeing that her fingers were trembling as she picked up the teacup and prepared to take a sip, Mrs. Livingston threatened, Mrs. Hunt, a mother's family is a woman's pride. If you let the Livingstones fall, you won't have anything left to be proud of. Mrs. Hunt threw the china teacup in her hand to the ground and pointed her bony finger at the door. Leave. Now. By the tone of her voice, Mrs. Livingston knew that all was lost. After she left, Mrs. Hunt sat there gasping for breath. The butler beside her quickly took out a calming pill and handed it to her. Mrs. Hunt's chest heaved violently, and she felt like her heart was about to explode. However, a few minutes after taking the medicine, she felt quite relieved. With the help of the butler, she slowly laid down on the sofa. After a long time, she slowly opened her glassy eyes and sighed. The butler asked, Mrs. Hunt, what do you need? Nothing. Mrs. Hunt opened her mouth as she studied at the small box of medicine. This medicine was made by Nora, correct? The butler nodded. Yes, Miss Smith made it herself. There are only two boxes in the entire city. You have one here, and the other box is with the Andersons. The old lady released a heavy sigh as her resentment toward Nora faded away. When she thought about what had happened earlier, she couldn't understand why she behaved the way that she did, and especially on behalf of those ungrateful people. She felt like such a foolish old woman. How could she have been so ridiculous as to push her favorite grandson away? She slowly closed her eyes in an effort to suppress that thought. Downstairs, arrangements had been made so that Ian could rest in the VIP room, while upstairs, the little trio was getting ready for their big debut. When the time came, Pete, Cherry, and Xander held hands as they went upstairs. 
Cherry took the middle position, with Pete on her left and Xander on her right. Pete looked dapper in his Gucci little gentleman's grey suit, and he wore it quite well as he loved suits. Xander, on the other hand, was quite out of place. Even though he was wearing the same outfit, he was twisting his body from side to side, uncomfortable to be wearing such a form-fitting and itchy ensemble. He had grown up in a basement and therefore had never worn clothes of this caliber and tailoring. He was used to loose pants and t-shirts, so he felt trapped in this suit with all of its accessories. He'd never even seen a tie his size before. But, even though he was uncomfortable, he was quite handsome, looking exactly like Justin when he was a boy. When the trio reached the landing, everyone below looked up at Xander. Pete sensed that something was wrong, and he glared over at Xander, who was squirming in the itchy clothes. Pete coughed to get his attention and said in a low voice, Don't twist around, it's embarrassing. Xander whispered back, My pants are too tight. As a boy, he understood this discomfort quite well. Sometimes his clothes would tighten before they were sorted out. He was about to humor Xander with some kind words when Cherry pushed away both of them and stepped in front. She directed, Step behind me and fix it. Pete and Xander used Cherry as a shield and made adjustments to Xander's suit so he wouldn't have to wiggle so much. Cherry held her full pink skirt out to the side and swished it around, scoring oohs and ahs from below. Over her shoulder, she whispered, Hurry up, I can't entertain them forever. Pete rolled his eyes because he knew his sister loved being the center of attention. We're finished. The two boys returned to their positions on either side of Cherry and commenced their promenade down the steps to laughter and applause. Cherry considered this the best moment of her life so far. Both boys were embarrassed. Most of the guests were also full of praise for the three beautiful children. However, Mrs. Livingston, who had snuck back into the party through the kitchen, continued her tirade against Nora and her children. Speaking of three children, Pete is the most outstanding. After all, he grew up beside his father since he was young. He looks like a little aristocrat, well-suited, pun intended, to his future role. But my goodness, how will Cherry and Xander ever live up to his prestige and presence? Even if it was to impress the powerful hunts, everyone praised the three children. Amidst the praise, Mrs. Livingston's words were especially striking. Stunned, the attendees stared at her in unison. Mrs. Livingston coughed. She knew that she had already offended Justin. Now she was ready to go all in. Why are you all looking at me? Check out the three children and you'll see that I'm right. Pete grew up with Justin, therefore he received an elite education ever since the age of two. You can't say that about Cherry. She grew up with Ms. Smith. And we all know about Ms. Smith's past, right? She grew up in a small place in California. What kind of knowledge and horizons could she have in such a rural setting? There's no way that Cherry's upbringing can even compare with Pete's. At this point, she looked at Cherry. Cherry, it's not that I'm criticizing you, sweetheart, but you have to study hard. Children who play computer games every day are bad, and this is particularly true of girls. Where are you to learn your manners? It isn't your fault, hon. You can't blame yourself for not having a suitable environment to grow up in. That responsibility lies with your mother. Although Nora was the eldest daughter of the Smiths, she grew up in rural California. Everyone knew that this was Nora's upbringing. But since Nora was Dr. Athena and the number one disciple of Dr. Zabe's, her presence carried a lot of weight. Therefore, a person could never know when they might need her help in the future. That thought was quite a motivator for loyalty and made everyone cautious about mentioning her past. But that didn't mean that people wouldn't think about it themselves or discuss it in private. 
Everyone sat in judgment of Cherry's background and activities on the internet. The little girl stood there gracefully. She was wearing a pink princess dress and a cute diamond tiara on her head. She was adorable no matter how much they judged her. Cherry blinked her dark eyes and her expression turned from little princess to Nora's angry daughter. She thought of the time when her brother Pete had forced her to study every day. The entire time, he would simply shake his head and tell her that she was going to embarrass Mummy if she didn't learn something. In her opinion, she was cute, clever, and charming. How could she possibly embarrass her mother? She was a princess at heart. But today, she understood what Pete was warning her about. This group of people thought that she and her mother had been living in a bad environment since she was a baby. It was more than she could bear. She was infuriated. She marched straight up to the overbearing woman and stuck her chin out. In her sweetest tone, she asked, So, auntie, have you been living well since you were young? Offended because everyone knew Mrs. Livingston was the daughter of a quite wealthy family, the woman mimicked the cheeky little girl, sticking her chin out and claiming, Of course. Cherry gave the woman a steely grin and said, Well, I certainly don't want to grow up in a good environment if it means that I will be like you, looking down my nose at other people and then sticking it into their business where it doesn't belong. She took a step back and covered her mouth. Then she demurely claimed, Oh, I should stay away from this woman. She's a bad influence, pointing her fingers at others and acting like she is better than they are. My mummy says this isn't good. But what does she know? She grew up in a small town in California. The partygoers bowed their heads or turned away so that they could smile without being seen by Mrs. Livingston. Everyone knew that they should never judge others. Among the wealthy families, this had always been the rule, no matter how difficult it might be to uphold. At this moment, Cherry's words made everyone present respect her. She had certainly put one of the number one offenders of this rule in her place. Apparently, Nora had done a pretty good job so far bringing up this lovely little girl. Mrs. Livingston was so angry that her entire body actually trembled. But she wasn't about to let this little brat have the last word. Excuse me, Miss Cherry. I am your relative and I am your elder. I am not meddling. I care about you, which grants me rights to correct the next generation. If you despise me for disciplining you, then you had better just get over it. Honestly, children these days are so sensitive. As an elder, I am not allowed to say anything. Pete narrowed his eyes and stepped forward. He grinned. Mrs. Livingston, I didn't know that we're relatives. Which family branch do you come from? Mrs. Livingston immediately said, Your great-grandmother is my aunt, which definitely makes me your relative. Pete mockingly acted stunned. He was very gentlemanly as he seriously asked, I think you might be mistaken. So, according to your assumption, that would make everyone here today a part of my family. Those who could attend the banquet were all from families deeply rooted in New York. So, what made Mrs. Livingston more qualified to judge the children than anyone else? His sarcastic tone was a slap to Mrs. Livingston's face, making her even angrier. She was about to speak out, but she had to remember that her family's relationship with the Hunts was really through Mrs. Hunt alone. She wanted to retort, but thought better of it and held her tongue. She then saw Ian and Justin descending the staircase. As the two family heads arrived, it signaled that it was time to give the children their presents. Ian's gifts to the children were his own shares in the company. He gave 5% to the three children just like that. The children received very precious and valuable gifts. The moment the shares were prevented, it immediately aroused the envy and admiration 
of everyone attending the party. The Smith Corporation had a market value of hundreds of billions of dollars. So 5% of the company's shares was a massive amount of money. Ian smiled as he turned to Cherry. In addition to giving her the shares, he took out an exquisitely decorated box. She carefully held it and lifted up the delicate lid. Inside was a diamond the size of a robin's egg. It was also of a similar size and color. Ian lifted the diamond out of the box and the partygoers gasped at its beauty. He held it in front of Cherry's eyes. This is the heart of the ocean. I got it at an auction a few years ago. I'm giving this to you today, Cherry. Do you like it? Cherry's eyes lit up and she clapped her hands several times. Oh yes, I do, I do. Ian smiled with satisfaction. The crowd was dumbfounded for an instant. Then a huge uproar was heard. That jewel was simply too rare. So many families had tried their hardest to fight for it, but they never expected that it would end up in the hands of a five-year-old. Everyone's eyes were filled with admiration. Well, that cherry is a lucky little girl. Then someone in the room remarked, What a pity. You know, there were originally two such diamonds, so that is just one of them. Somewhere there is another one just like this one, but its whereabouts are unknown even today. Must you always complain? Having one is enough. It's only because the Smiths have such a big business that they can win the jewel in the auction. Apart from the hunts, who else is rich enough to do that? While everyone was chatting about Cherry's blue diamond, there were also some who didn't agree with the way Mrs. Livingston had lectured the child on her birthday. They immediately said, mockingly, no matter what Cherry's life was in the past, from the very day she returned to New York, she has been living in a nest of gold and silver. Yes, it's true. And that girl still has a whole load of blessings ahead of her. Mr. Hunt dotes on his little girl. There is no doubt about it, she is the undisputed little princess of New York. The comments and banters with veiled insults made Mrs. Livingston so angry that she immediately retorted, but it won't get rid of the fact that she lived in poverty when she was younger. A child's personality solidifies by the time they turn five. You can't say that she lived in poverty, right? I heard that their family is pretty well-to-do. Although the Smiths in California were not as wealthy as the Smiths in New York, they were still well off. With an annual income of over $5 million, it would certainly be difficult to consider the family poor. Mrs. Livingston pursed her lips. Hmm, if they aren't poor, then why don't we see any of her relatives coming over to give the children gifts? Everyone was speechless. Most of the people who came with gifts had presented them on the spot. Ian, who was an especially close family member, had caused a huge sensation when presenting his gifts. But it was true they didn't see any gifts from anyone currently residing where Nora used to live. While considering this point, Mrs. Livingston scanned through the crowd and spotted Lisa Black, Nora's cousin from California. Although her father, Henry, mistreated her, Nora had always been on good terms with her Aunt Irene. And Lisa loved playing with Nora when they were children. They had always been close. Since her children were celebrating their birthdays, Nora had sent an invitation to her aunt in the hopes that she would be able to attend. However, where they lived was simply too far away. In addition, Nora's father, Henry, had gone too far overboard, so her aunt was too embarrassed to visit Nora. Instead, her aunt sent over Lisa, who was studying at the New York University of Medicine to represent their family. Happily, Lisa who had bought Lego sets for the children, was carrying the packages into the room at that specific moment. Mrs. Livingston, who had done in-depth research on Nora, knew that Lisa was Nora's cousin. She launched into mockery mode at once and said, Oh my, it's not like none of her relatives came. Isn't that Ms. Black? 
she waved the young woman over to join the group. Mrs. Livingston loved an audience for her tirades. She lured her in. You're Miss Smith's cousin, right? I think your mother is her aunt. Isn't that right? Lisa flushed. She nodded and tried to set the gifts down on a side table. She didn't want to do anything that would embarrass Nora, and she had seen all of the expensive gifts from others. The Lego sets that she had brought seemed inadequate compared to the rest. Pouncing on the moment, Mrs. Livingston called out, What are those? The gifts you bought for the children? Lisa blushed and glanced around the room. It was clear from her expression that she wanted to be somewhere else. She took a step back in silence as if trying to escape. But Mrs. Livingston wasn't about to miss this opportunity. She ran her hands across the Lego boxes. Looking down her nose, she smirked. Oh my, are those Lego sets? Well, isn't that thoughtful. She studied the picture on the box and suggested, are these bootlegs? Her blush turned to a flush of anger as Lisa protested, absolutely not. I purchased these from the official store and these are the premium sets. Sarcastically, Mrs. Livingston sneered, oh, the premium. What, that must have cost you at least, what, $300? since they are authentic. As soon as she said that, Lisa realized that the woman was making fun of her. She glanced around and saw everyone staring at her in disbelief. She was at a complete loss and wanted to find some place to hide. Fortunately, Louis walked up behind Lisa and put his arm around her shoulders. He grinned and said, Lisa, I'm looking around for the gifts I asked you to buy on my behalf. He scanned around the room and saw the Lego boxes. He exclaimed, Ah, here they are. Cherry and Pete love their Legos and asked me to get these toys for them. He studied the boxes. And you got the premium boxes. You are the best. He gave her a kiss on the cheek, picked up the Lego sets, and walked them over to Cherry and Pete. Happy birthday, little guys. Cherry jumped up and down and clapped her hands. Thank you, Uncle Louie. This is just what we wanted. Look, Pete. The little boy shook his head. That's great. Xander will love these too. Louis said, You know your Uncle Louis has lots of money. Why must you insist on something like this? What am I going to do with all that money now? His words were a dig at Mrs. Livingston. In her mind, if Lisa was the one giving them a gift worth only $300, then perhaps it was because she was poor but if Louis, as a New York Smith, gave the same present, how could it possibly be viewed as not good enough? Everyone knew that he had millions of dollars in the bank. Mrs. Livingston frowned and clenched her fists. She sneered. Oh, please, Mr. Smith, you deserve an acting award. But since you gave them the lovely gift, then what is Ms. Black intending to give the children? Unless, of course, you came empty-handed. Louis viewed Mrs. Livingston as a fly in the room that he was trying to get to go out the window. Why did she insist on pursuing this? Given his true miserly nature, he wasn't about to buy them gifts. He planned to give the children his stray cats and dogs. How could he possibly take the cats and dogs out now and say that they were from Lisa? He knew that the children liked animals, but if they came from Lisa... Wouldn't that again highlight that Nora was from a poor family? Louis was furious. If he had known that he had to show off for Mrs. Livingston and her cronies, he would have spent a few hundred thousand dollars and brought them an expensive gift. As it was, all he could do was smile sheepishly and say, Why does she have to give them gifts? She is younger than Nora and is studying at the moment. Are there any younger sisters who give their elder sister's children gifts when they are still in school? While that was certainly true, in this situation, Mrs. Livingston, unfortunately, knew that she had gained the upper hand with that comment. I guess that the family Miss Smith used to live with weren't planning to give the children any gifts then. Everyone started to speculate. Did Miss Smith really live in such poor conditions back then? Mrs. Livingston continued to discredit Nora. 
I have heard that her stepfather treated her very badly in the past. When she was a child, she didn't even go to school, and her clothes were all from thrift shops and goodwill, so I guess that it is understandable that a family like that wouldn't have the resources to attend or even send any gifts. As she finished speaking, a quite distinguished man dressed in a black suit walked into the room. He was quite tall and old, but still very gentlemanly. He had the manner of an English butler. He clicked his heels and bowed his head to Cherry. With a smile, he announced, Ms. Cherry, I've come to give you your birthday gift. And he sounded like a British butler as well. Cherry's eyes lit up when she saw him. Grandpa John, I'm so happy to see you. Was my grand aunt able to come? Cherry looked expectantly toward the front door. John shook his head and replied, I'm sorry, Miss Cherry. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to make it. It is such a long journey. But she has sent me with your gifts, and I know that you are going to like them. She has spared no expense to make you happy. When Mrs. Livingston heard him, she immediately curled her lips disdainfully. Everyone in the room had relatives abroad, so she wasn't impressed. And this so-called Grandpa John didn't look like someone from a huge conglomerate. At best, he was the head butler of some grand European household. Never would she have thought that she was actually right on the mark. Mrs. Livingston inquired, So, Cherry, you have a grand-aunt overseas? What does she do for a living? I'm sure you're anxious to see what she has sent. Quick, open the present and let us have a look. Mrs. Livingston looked at Cherry with a big smile after she spoke. She was setting herself up for the next opportunity to put Nora in her place. Louis had excused Lisa's lack of a gift for now, so she couldn't attack Nora from that angle. But in the next moment, a butler had brought a gift to Cherry from some so-called grand-aunt. It seemed like the perfect opportunity to bring Ms. Smith down a notch or two in front of everyone exactly what Mrs. Livingston was hoping for. She could hardly wait for Cherry to open the box. She stared hard at the gift with a scorching gaze, as if she were trying to set the box on fire. At the side, both Ian and Justin narrowed their eyes. They glanced at Mrs. Livingston, but neither of them spoke. Both knew very well that Nora was an extraordinary woman, and that the people she knew in the past were all very impressive. However, everyone seemed to be of the consensus that Nora had lived in tough circumstances growing up. In fact, they had even spun a dramatic version in their heads about how the poor girl had survived after her stepfather robbed her of the only financial assets that her mother had left behind. Therefore, even though they all knew that Nora's medical skills were fantastic, the moment they thought of her past, they felt pity and sympathy for her. Most people considered that things would have been completely different had she grown up in New York. She would most certainly have gone beyond her mother, Yvonne Smith. And while she was an excellent doctor now, there didn't seem anything else about her that was unique. She certainly didn't have the connections that everyone in their social circle emphasized as important. If the social circle a person hung out with was impressive, then that's what would make them impressive. Nora was already a full-grown adult. On top of that, she didn't have any appropriate girlfriends among her peers in New York, which reduced her social circle even more. Nora was the young lady of the Smiths and would be the future Mrs. Hunt. Once she married, apart from holding an occasional medical consultation, it was assumed that she would most likely stay at home, lead a normal life, and be a good wife and mother to her husband and kids. She obviously had a good family, but had never received the proper education and had no adequate opportunities that were given in certain social circles of New York. It was a story worthy of being extolled, but was also lamentable. This was the reason why Justin and Ian wanted to give Nora the opportunity to set an example 
and establish prestige among her peers today at this event, so that everyone could see for herself. Everyone was dumbfounded when they heard the butler's announcement. Princess Lucy from Britain? Who was that? Everyone looked at Justin, wondering if the Hunts could really get a member of the British royal family to visit in person and offer well wishes to their children for their birthday. Everyone knew that it was difficult for wealthy American families to establish good relations with the royal family. While everyone was marveling at this new development, someone asked, Mr. Hunt, when did you make friends with the British royal family? Justin, however, frowned. Unlike everyone else, the princess's arrival did not ruffle him. He calmly instructed the butler, Everyone visiting is a guest. Show her in. Yes, sir, the butler replied, bowed his head once and went out again. As he left, Mrs. Livingston queried Cherry, Which country is your grand-aunt living in? Cherry tilted her head and grinned, Great Britain? Mrs. Livingston covered her mouth and laughed. Oh my, isn't that a coincidence? So it is because of Mr. Hunt that a princess of the British royal family is visiting you. Aren't you one lucky girl? Her comments implied that it was the Hunts, not Nora, who had the connection with royalty. But as soon as she said that, Justin said, I am not the one who invited the princess. Justin did not know Princess Lucy, but he knew her mother, in other words, the Queen of the United Kingdom. However, he chose not to share that fact. And what he said was not a lie. He intentionally had not sent the Queen an invitation because he wanted to keep the party low profile. After all, the children's fifth birthday was not a big occasion. Could it be that the Queen had heard about his children's birthday, so she sent the little princess here to please him? The doors opened as the butler led the distinguished guests into the massive hall. A young girl with blonde hair and blue eyes walked in. Her big eyes were bright and twinkling. Her curly, shoulder-length hair was spread out slightly behind her and her formal dress cinched her waist, making her look slim and graceful. Although she was only five, the princess looked just like a doll and was extraordinarily beautiful. Behind the princess were her bodyguards, dressed in professional attire. They scanned their surroundings vigilantly in order to protect the princess. After Lucy entered, her big eyes blinked and she scanned the room. Although she was young, her every move carried an air of nobility and elegance. She had obviously been well-trained. Justin took a step forward and came up to Lucy. Following the proper protocol for younger members of the royal family, he addressed the attendant next to her. Why is Princess Lucy visiting our humble abode? With a smile, the attendant replied, Good day, Mr. Hunt. When Her Highness learned of her close friend's birthday, she insisted on coming over for a visit. As soon as he said that, Justin narrowed his eyes. The people around them who had heard the attendant were also surprised. A close friend of the royal princess? Everyone turned and looked at Cherry, Pete and Xander once more. So, which of the little ones was the princess's friend? Mrs. Livingston didn't hear the exchange, so she was still a little dazed. She stood to the side with her hands on her hips, lecturing Cherry. You see that princess over there? There's grace in her every action. That's self-confidence that only a good family background can provide. What a shame that you didn't grow up in a good environment. Even if you do become the young lady of the hunts, you will never have a bearing as outstanding as hers. It must be thrilling for you. I'm sure that just a few months ago, you had never even dared imagine that you would ever see a princess in person. Cherry studied Mrs. Livingston and shrugged her shoulders. She had no idea what the woman was talking about because she couldn't see Princess Lucy through the sea of people around them. She did notice everyone staring at Mrs. Livingston as though she was a fool. Mrs. Livingston didn't understand why everyone was staring at her. Instead, she continued speaking smugly. What are all of you looking at me like that for? Am I wrong? 
You don't have the guts to say these things, but I do. And it isn't just Cherry, but Ms. Smith, too. No matter what, it's just not good to grow up in a family like that. They will never live up to the rest of us. Seeing her performing a one-woman show over there, Cherry gave her a push and said, Excuse me, Granny, you are blocking my way. I can't see. Mrs. Livingston, who had been pushed aside, stumbled to the side. She looked over at Cherry furiously. That's so rude of you, Cherry. How can you treat your elders like that? You should learn from Princess Lucy, take a gander at her disposition and manners. You will learn something very valuable, and... She stopped speaking when she saw Cherry, with joy all over her face, lift the hem of her little skirt like a princess and hurry past her. On the other side of the room, Princess Lucy had the same expression of joy on her face when she found her dear friend. With the same gesture, she picked up the hem of her skirt and rushed over to her sweet companion. Cherry! Princess Lucy! The two little girls squealed out each other's names as they rushed toward each other. The adults standing in between them stepped aside one after another to make way for the princesses to pass by. In full view of everyone present, the two cherubs met in the center of the room. At a distance of four inches apart, they came to a stop. Both of them curtsied and bowed their heads, greeting one another quite elegantly. Their movements were regal and graceful, as if they were in a ballet. Cherry and Princess Lucy's movements also mirrored the other. When they were done, the two little girls finally held each other's hands, laughing and giggling as they jumped up and down happily like normal little girls. My dear Lucy, why are you here? asked Cherry. Princess Lucy replied, Because I missed you, my best friend. Cherry laughed loudly, her voice crisp and clear as it rang through the great hall. Princess Lucy smiled at her happily. Then she said, It seems that you have fallen behind quite a fair bit in your etiquette lessons in the six months since we last met. If Mrs. Steve hears of this, I'm afraid she will make you practice extra hours each day to make up the time. Cherry stuck out her tongue and gave her princess friend a raspberry. You don't seem to be up on your etiquette lessons either. Princess Lucy burst into laughter. After you left, I made an excuse and stopped going to classes. We both passed the exam a long time ago, so Mother said that I didn't have to go anymore. That's awesome. You're so lucky. Cherry clapped her hands with joy. Lisa, who could hear them, was dumbfounded. She subconsciously asked, Cherry, do you and Princess Lucy share the same etiquette teacher? Cherry nodded. Yep, we went to lessons together. Mrs. Steve is the best etiquette teacher in the UK. My grandaunt says that girls should learn to carry themselves well, so she sent me to take the lessons. Later, Princess Lucy begged Mrs. Steve to teach her at the same time she taught me. That way, we could take the classes together. And that's how we met each other. Her words shocked everyone in the room. After they heard the girls' conversation, everyone's opinions had been swayed. They now understood that Cherry had lived an extraordinary life abroad. It was common for wealthy families to find a way to hire teachers who exclusively taught the royal family. They would be able to invite these instructors to their homes to give their children private lessons. Everyone assumed that it was Nora or Cherry's grandaunt who had done the same thing. Her grandaunt must have wanted to have Cherry become acquainted with Princess Lucy through the etiquette teacher. This would be the most convenient way for the family to establish a connection with the royal family. But there was something different happening with regard to Cherry and her mother. Going by what Cherry had said just now, it appeared that it was not her grandaunt who wanted to gain favor with the royal family, but it was the other way around. So, just what kind of social status did Cherry's grandaunt have? Lisa smiled to herself and remembered Mrs. Livingston lecturing Cherry about the little girl's upbringing. 
And hadn't the brazen woman criticized the child for having poor etiquette? Grinning, Lisa asked, Mrs. Livingston, how do you find Cherry's etiquette? Or perhaps training for the royal family is not good enough for you either. When the woman didn't answer, Lisa continued, Is there anything else about her upbringing that doesn't live up to your expectations? Mrs. Livingston was dumbfounded by it all. She stared at Cherry incredulously, feeling like her face had already gone numb from how far it had fallen. How could this be? How could this little brat, Cherry, know the princess of the royal family? Moreover, she seemed to know the princess very well. In the eyes of everyone there, Cherry and Nora were transformed from backwoods trailer trash into towering giants of New York society. Their image had become high and lofty in an instant, making them seem like people beyond everyone's reach. In fact, the two of them had risen several notches above the level that Yvette Smith had obtained back in her day. Everyone swallowed their pride. After a moment of awkward silence, the room was abuzz with their sincere congratulations. Mr. Hunt, Miss Smith is so amazing. She has a daughter who is good friends with a princess. How is that possible? Mr. Smith, even though Miss Smith was not by your side all these years, it looks like she has been living very well. Where is the woman of the hour? Where is Miss Smith? Why isn't she here? I want to talk to her about parenting and ask her how she raised Cherry so well. While everyone was offering their congratulations, Justin smiled slightly. Then he stared down Mrs. Livingston and stated, Mrs. Livingston, you've had your fill of fun. I am assuming that you are done with your snide comments about my fiancé now, but I could be wrong. Mrs. Livingston bit her lip. I didn't expect Miss Smith to have such a superior standard of living. Please don't take offense. I had my concerns, but now I see that it was all for naught. Fine, I see that I was worried for nothing. I only had your interests in mind when I said all that. I was worried that you were about to wed an inappropriate woman, a gold digger. But I understand it all now, so I'm not worried anymore. Rest assured that I have nothing more to say. Smiling awkwardly, she glanced around the room and turned to exit. But as soon as she turned, Justin's frosty voice reached her. Wait a minute, Mrs. Livingston. You may not have anything else to say, but I do. Taken aback, Mrs. Livingston froze in her place. Everyone also quieted down and looked over. The room was utterly silent. He waited until she finally turned to face him. When she did, Justin slowly glanced at the head butler. Once he caught his eye, Justin stared at Mrs. Livingston and said in a deep, authoritative voice, it seems that some of our staff don't understand the delineation of who is a member of the Hunt family and who isn't. So I will make it perfectly clear. Anyone who is from beyond the third generation will no longer be considered a close relative. Therefore, the Hunt Manor will be off limits to anyone at this level of lineage. From this moment on, they will not be allowed to enter the property and will face the consequences of being a trespasser going forward. Understanding immediately, the head butler nodded his head, straightened his back, and replied, Yes, sir. In front of the room, the head butler approached Mrs. Livingston. Holding out his white-gloved hand, he smiled and politely asked, I think that there has been an oversight, Mrs. Livingston. May I please see your invitation to this party? Mrs. Livingston searched around the room. How would she possibly have one? All the guests at the birthday party were invited by Justin and Nora. Having never received one, she went straight to Mrs. Hunt to gain access into the Hunt Manor. Trembling, she shook her head. I, 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 no, 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 I, I don't. The head butler dropped his head and turned to Justin. So my apologies, there seems to have been an oversight on my end. I will forgo three months of pay as punishment. Justin slowly grinned. That won't be necessary. 
He turned, and with intense delight, he stared straight into Mrs. Livingston's eyes. With steely tones in his voice, he commanded, Just remove her from my house, now, and don't forget about her son. With that, the head butler gestured with that same white-gloved hand and called out, Sentinels, this woman is here without an invitation. Please remove her from the premises and make sure that she doesn't return. Mrs. Livingston's eyes widened, and she looked at the butler in disbelief. How? How dare you? The security officers had already rushed over. Taking the stubborn woman by the arms, they hurried her out of the great hall and to the front door. She struggled fiercely, creating an extremely embarrassing sight. At the same time, the two other guards had located Thomas playing with the youngsters and escorted him out as well. The entire incident had left an unpleasant taste in everyone's mouth. No matter how great a feud was between families, generally speaking, no one would consider throwing a guest of equal social standing straight out of their house. It would ruin the atmosphere of the party and certainly make people look down upon the host. It was clear by Justin's actions that he didn't care about such conventions. Instead, he was sending a clear message to everyone present. Justin Hunt would no longer deal with the Livingstons. The guests at the party were all either rich or of noble descent, and all of them immediately understood the implications of Justin's edict. The first person to speak after the incident was the president of a certain bank. He stepped forward at once. The Livingstons owe the bank $30 million. I'll have to press them for it tomorrow. Another entrepreneur added, If that's the case, then I don't believe that they will have any cash flow left. I think we better suspend our project with them. The old adage was in effect. Everyone kicked a person when they were down. If things continued this quickly, the Livingstons would most likely have to declare bankruptcy the next day. Justin raised his head in satisfaction and looked at Ian. A few moments before, he had sensed Ian's desire to avenge himself against the Livingstons. Justin wondered what the Smiths' dark forces would do to them. He wanted to ask his future father-in-law if the man was going to take action. If he had no intentions, then Justin would make the arrangements himself. Unexpectedly, when he looked over, he instead found Ian, surrounded by partygoers, looking somewhat distracted. He was staring hard at the pair of hearts of the ocean with an irritated look on his face. When Cherry had run over to Lucy, she placed the gems in his hands. The two gems. He had bought the first heart of the ocean and given it to her back then. And here it was again. The trembling Ian raised his head and stared at the butler named John, who was standing next to him. Ian's fingers curled tightly into fists. He asked hoarsely, The lady you serve, who is she? The tall and thin John was a little surprised by his question and the forceful manner in which Ian asked it. But he politely replied, Mr. Smith, my lady's name is Jessica. Jessica? Ian queried. Is she American? Yes, she is. So she was an American. Ian's heart thumped wildly as he queried, Does she go by any other name? Yes. John paused and then said, She also goes by Queenie Schmidt. Ian lowered his eyes in disappointment when he heard the unfamiliar name. He stared at the two gems in his hand. Suddenly, he pointed at them and asked, Do you know how she acquired this diamond? John answered knowingly, Mom said that a friend who had passed away gave it to her for safekeeping. And since that friend's granddaughter's birthday is today, she is fulfilling her friend's request and returning it to its rightful owner. A friend who had already passed away had given it to her. That friend must have been Yvette Anderson. Ian's disappointment grew even stronger. 
he shook his head, feeling like he must have lost his mind. Although he knew very well that Yvette had died 20 years ago, the moment he heard this bit of news about her, he could not help but wonder if she was still alive somewhere in the world. He lowered his gaze and put the gems together into the box. Then he sighed. As he had recently recovered, he still couldn't stand for very long. He turned to John. Excuse me. Thank you for your assistance, but I must rest now. Then Ian turned, went up the stairs and to the VIP lounge to rest. Justin noticed that his future father-in-law's good mood seemed to quickly deflate. The man appeared to suddenly become depressed. He followed after him and asked, Uncle Ian, what's wrong? Ian waved him off. It's nothing. You get back to the party. Justin held his arm and said, I'll take you upstairs and we can check in on Nora along the way. Ian nodded and Justin took his arm to assist the man upstairs. Ian was beginning to understand why his daughter particularly hated crowds the most. Luckily, she wasn't the star today, so she was able to hide upstairs the whole time. But after Justin helped Ian upstairs, he found that Nora, who was supposed to be resting in the VIP lounge, had disappeared. Where had she gone? Sounds from the extraordinarily lively party drifted up from downstairs. Cherry and Princess Lucy hadn't seen each other for a very long time, so they had a lot to talk about. They sat so closely together and chatted so animatedly that people could have mistaken them for conjoined twins. As for Pete, he was surrounded by his cousins from the hunts. He was the future heir and had grown up and gone to school with them at the Hunt Manor. Thus, even though he was introverted, the group of children played with him respectfully. Pete became bored with them, so he turned and joined the children from Cherry's kindergarten instead. After all, he had gone to school with them when he pretended to be Cherry. Many of the guests had also brought children of similar age with them. Led by Mia, the children knew better than to disturb Cherry and Princess Lucy, so she led them to circle around Pete instead. Wow, you look just like Cherry! Someone stretched out their little hand to pinch Pete's cheek, but he swatted it away. Smiling shyly, Mia gave Pete a birthday present. I drew this for you, Pete. Have a look and see if it looks good. When Pete opened it, he found that it was a drawing of three children. Two of the children looked exactly the same in the face. The one wearing the pink satin was Cherry. Next to him was a boy wearing a small suit. This was Pete. And the timid little girl in the middle was none other than Mia. Mia looked at him and said timidly, Pete, can the three of us stay together forever? When Pete and Cherry were staying with the Smiths, they hadn't played with Brandon, only with Mia. The three of them got along very well. She liked both of them very much. Pete nodded. Sure. Brandon, who had been in a state of shock and silence ever since he saw Pete come down the stairs with Cherry, cried out, So you are two different people, and you're a boy, not a girl. After a moment of silence, the children all burst out laughing at Brandon's comment, which was contagious. The whole party livened up because of their musical laughter. In a corner no one was paying any attention to, Xander stood all by himself and looked around blankly. He didn't have a single friend here. Apart from the three gifts from his direct relatives, no one else here would bring him gifts. Wow, did you see? Princess Lucy gave Cherry a diamond hairpin. It is really pretty. Mia also drew a picture for Pete, and Brandon gave Pete his favorite model airplane. When is my birthday? I want gifts too. In the children's world, how expensive a gift was didn't matter. What mattered was the amount of sincerity in the little gifts that the classmates gave one another. Xander clenched his jaw. He balled up his little fists tightly. He just wanted to go back to his basement and lock himself away. Just as his imagination began to run wild, a big warm hand suddenly stroked his hair. 
Xander was surprised. He looked up abruptly and saw Nora standing over him. The woman was tall and slim. Her almond-shaped eyes were slightly downcast. When he raised his head, the woman adjusted her clothes with her long and slender bandaged hands. She slowly squatted down so that she could be at his eye level and said, Happy birthday, precious. She leaned in and kissed his face. Xander's cheeks were slowly starting to burn. The woman's voice was low and soothing. He relished the feeling for a brief second and then became somewhat embarrassed. He coughed and grumbled under his breath. Don't call me that, it's so mushy. Nora laughed, then teased him. What do you want me to call you? Babe? Darling? Or Sweet Cheeks? Or perhaps just Xander? Xander rolled his eyes. Don't be silly, just call me Xander. Please, be serious. Nora retracted her smile. She extended her uninjured hand to him and said, Hello, Xander. Let me introduce myself. My name is Nora Smith, and I am your mummy. Hmm, she continued. Although I have been Cherry's mother for five years, and Pete's mother for just three months, I am still a bit incompetent as a mother. But... I am looking forward to being your mother. I hope we can get along in the future. Oh, and by the way, my hobby is sleeping. The woman was speaking to him so seriously that he smiled. She did what he had asked. He paused. He grinned, and he took her hand. Hello, Nora Smith. My name is Xander. Although I have a father, I'm not really sure if he's my real father, so it's as if I never had one. So, this feels like the first time being someone's son. I hope you will please take care of me. Solemn like his father, this was the first time she had seen him smile. It made him look absolutely adorable. Nora stroked his cheek, making him blush again. It will be my pleasure. We'll both do our best, agreed? He tried to resist. The way she spoke as if she were coaxing little babies, sure was dumb, but he liked it anyway. Impulsively, he threw his arms around her neck and squeezed her tight. She smelled good. Seeing his brother, Pete brought over a box and handed Xander a gift. Taken aback, Xander stared at the box in front of him. That's for me. Pete nodded. Although you haven't acknowledged the two of us yet, Mummy has told us that you are our brother, so, happy birthday, Xander. Xander felt a stinging in his eyes. He shyly took the gift. But knowing he hadn't done the same for his siblings, he stuck his chin out and claimed defensively. I didn't prepare birthday presents for you guys, though. I didn't know I was supposed to. That's okay, Xander. You can do it next year. Cherry also walked over hand in hand with Princess Lucy. She handed him the little gift that she had prepared a long time ago and said, We are older than you, so we don't mind. Since you are the baby, we will give in to you. Xander frowned with anger. I'm not the baby. I'm your elder brother. Cherry tilted her head. You are my younger brother. We are particular about who comes first. Besides, isn't it great being a younger brother? This way, I'll give in to you and protect you. Pete also nodded and agreed with Cherry. Xander stomped his foot in protest. But before the children could continue their quarrel, the head butler approached Nora and whispered in her ear, A package for young Xander has been delivered to the front door. <laughs>